so today is friend day. Why friend day? Why friend day? Well, it's very simple. Because your friends are awesome, is that right? Yeah. Do you know that Americans with no friends has quadrupled since 1990? Did you know that? Think about that. Uh, Over four times as many people say they have no friends as they did in 1990. Wow. And 20% of Europeans, the latest study said, 20% of Europeans are certified lonely, lonely. What's going on? Well, you need friends. So that's why Friend Day. Friend Day is an opportunity for us to tell you, you belong. You belong. I don't care who you are, where you came from, what you've done, you belong. You belong here. You belong because we're just as goofed up as you are. We just want to follow Jesus and we're inviting you into it too. So if you think you've gone too far, done too bad, whatever it is, you belong. All right? So I'm going to ask us to practice this. We're going to read a scripture, and to do that, well, before we do that, let me, let me start how I always do. I need crowd participation. Would you be my friend? Yes. Crowd participation. You ready? Knock, knock. Yes. Cows go. Cows go. No, cows go moo, not cows go who. <laughs> All right, one more. Crowd participation. Knock, knock. Yes. Little old lady. Oh, y'all can yodel. All right. Uh, Come on. Uh, You got to be my friend. You got to smile at me at some point here, all right? So would everybody stand up for your feet in honor of God's word? We're going to read a scripture, and then we're going to act like we like each other, all right? We'll we'll pretend, all right? I'll pretend. No. Uh, We're going to read a scripture because this is what we do. We stand in honor of God's word here because we believe that God's word has the power to change our hearts and change our lives. We believe that God gave us his word as an instruction to us, but more important than that, to breathe life into us. It's not some perfect, made-up, concrete book. It's a book of life and breath. And what we want to do is we want to respect the fact that God talks to us through the scriptures more than we want to worship a book. We don't worship a book. We respect the God who talks through it. Are you all following me? All right. Luke chapter 22, verse 48. Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? It's sort of like we picked the song on purpose, right? Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And that's the verse we're going to talk about today. I'll give you some insight into the biblical story. And... uh, Tell you what, if you'll give me 30 minutes, I'll try to wrap it up. Y'all ready? All right. Jesus, I ask that you would help us, that you would breathe through your word today. You would speak through your word, that our hearts would be open to you, and that in the name of Jesus, every single person walked through the door today would hear your truth, and you would pull us into relationship with you, and that we would see how we've been a Judas too, and that our hearts would be open to how to be restored. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Now, wait before you're seated. This is what we do around here, because here's what we found out during COVID, right? Everybody hid from each other, and anxiety and depression went through the roof, skyrocketed. Do you know what you need? You need somebody to look you in the eye and smile at you. And it always works when you give a high five, except I noticed today too many of you ate donuts and licked your fingers. So we're not going to high five today, okay? We're not going to high five today. In, in the honor of trying to keep the semi-sanitary, we're going to fist bump today, all right? Y'all ready? Could you do that? Could you turn to three or four people, give them a big fist bump and say hi and a big smile, all right? Online, there you go. Fist bump and smile. All right, y'all ready? You ever been stabbed in the back? Anybody ever been stabbed in the back? Um, How did you feel when you were betrayed? You know, there was somebody that promised to love you. Maybe they promised they'd always be your friend. Maybe they promised they would honor you, protect you, keep you. Always got your back, bro. Or maybe you got married or I don't know what it is. And the person like stabbed you in the back. Um, How'd that make you feel? 
Ooh, how could somebody who promises to love you intentionally harm you? Ooh, it's rough, isn't it? So I was walking through a store recently, and I'm a pastor, so I've been stabbed in the back a lot. I've had things told about me there in any way I said them, all right? I, I know what it's like because people hear what they want to hear and they say what they want to say, and I got some big ones back here. One of the worst, though, was this person, and I'm walking through a store the other day with me and my wife, and we spy them on another aisle. I would like to say I was the mature Christian, and I went over to them and said, hey, how you doing? Instead, what I said is, let's duck. Anybody ever been there? Come on, you ever been there? All right, yeah, yeah, that's what I did. So we ducked down another aisle and we got out of the store so we wouldn't have to talk to him. I've forgiven him. I told you it was a him, sorry. I've forgiven him. Uh, I met with him, talked to him, forgave him, prayed for him, blessed him, and moved him on. But I don't want a small talk with him. Are, are, anybody in the room know what I'm talking about here? So our song today is about a Judas kiss. The guy that was Jesus' friend stabbed him in the back. We'll get to Judas in a second, but let's talk about another guy, um, Benedict Arnold. Y'all know anything about Benedict Arnold? Can I give you a little history lesson? So Benedict Arnold was really a successful leader in the Revolutionary War. Did y'all know that? He was really good. He was, as a matter of fact, on uh, at one place in, uh, in West Point, they actually study this one campaign he led because he was so brilliant in his leading of it. But, except for one thing, he always had this little reckless bent to him. He went too far too often. And he would go too far too often to be reckless at the edges when he didn't have to be. He did brilliant things, but he, he didn't keep it in check. Um, he led successes in 1777 against the British at Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, when they were attacking New York, there was another one, another one, another one. There were like five in a row. And the last one, he got injured. So when he got injured, they sent him to Philadelphia to heal up. And while he was in Philadelphia, well, I, I'm going to read a direct quote from one of the histories I read. It said, uh, he socialized with families of loyalists to the British sympathies, and he lived extravagantly. So you know what he did? He uh, lived recklessly again, except this time he had to make money to cover his extravagant living. And to do so, he crossed some lines, which actually led to him being on the verge of being court-martialed because he broke so many laws trying to get money. You're going to notice some similarities here. <laughs> so here he is all concerned about money. And um, he then married a girl who was a loyalist. And after that, it went downhill. The British, he went to the British and said, hey, would you give me the equivalent of today's money, $400,000? I will turn West Point over to you for $400,000. So the price of his country and his morality and the price of his good name wound up being $400,000. And, uh, you know, it wound up happening that he had his good friend who was this British sympathizer with him and his uh, contact, and he wound up abandoning him and allowing him to be hanged while he got off scot-free at the expense of his friend. So when we talk about Benedict Arnold, we're talking about a guy that all of us would view as the ultimate traitor. But today I want to talk to you about one who was even more of an ultimate traitor, and you're going to see some similarities. Today we're going to talk about a guy named Judas Iscariot. So um, I, want to, I want to go through, I want to just lay out for you a couple of minutes who Judas Iscariot was and what scriptures say about him. And uh, let's talk, first of all, Judas was included. Sometimes when we think about traitors, we, we think about people that do bad stuff. We think maybe they're on the fringes and outside of culture. Maybe they weren't really a friend to begin with. But one thing we know about Judas is Judas was included. He was one of the original 12. Now, Jesus spent an entire night praying, asking God for direction, and he picked 12 people to be his inner circle. He picked them, handpicked them, and Judas was one of them. In uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it says Jesus called his 12 disciples to him. So these are the 12 that he handpicked that he picked to be his inner circle, to hang with him, to learn from him. 
And it says, he gave them, listen to this, Judas, this includes Judas. They gave him authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So one thing we know about Judas is Judas was included not only in the group, but he was also included in the power. I, I don't think you got this. Judas went around and in the name of Jesus, casting out demons and healing sick people and watching them get well with his own eyes. Judas saw people delivered. Judas saw people healed. Judas was there on the Sermon on the Mount. He heard Jesus teach the Sermon on the Mount. He actually got the explanation in private to the parable of the four soils. He ate some of the bread and the fishes of the 5,000 that Jesus fed. Actually, he got his own lunch basket. There were 12 baskets filled. He got his own lunch basket filled with the leftovers of the miracle that he saw with his own eyes. He saw, he was in the boat when Jesus came walking to him on the water. He was, he was there when Jesus turned to the wind and the waves and he said, hey, be, be still. And all of creation obeyed the word of Jesus. He was there when the legion of demons came out of the guy with the legion of demons and the pigs ran down the hill. He was there when demons declared, I know who you are. You're the son of the most high God. And Jesus would say, shut up, shut up. I don't, I don't want your testimony. He was there. He saw it all. He was included. He was as inner circle as you get. He saw the blind eyes open, the deaf ears hearing, the lepers clean, the sick healed. He saw it all. He wasn't some doubter on the periphery, on the sidelines. He was truly included. You ever notice, though, that when we don't want to be included, we start making up reasons why we're not? You ever notice how we always defend our stupidity? Anybody really good? I am the world's best salesman. I am the world's best salesman. I have talked myself into every stupid thing I have ever done. Me. Nobody else talked me into it. I talked me into it, right? And, and here he was included, but I guarantee you Judas convinced himself that he was on the outside. We had a girl like this <clears throat> when I was youth pastor. We had a Barnabas team. That's what we called it, Barnabas team. It was our uh, leaders who acted like Barnabas, who were the includers, the ones who took risks on people who loved, who served, who gave. That's what I called them. And I made this girl a member of our Barnabas team. So she was included at all the, we had a one bedroom or a two bedroom apartment at that time. And she would be included to our house at the two bedroom apartment. We couldn't include anybody in that postage stamp living room, but yet we invited her. She was at all of our meetings and she was at everything we did. But yet, do you know how many times I heard her say, nobody likes me, nobody wants to hang out with me. And I'm like, you're being an idiot right now. Am I allowed to say that? And some of you, can I, can I tell you the inner dialogue you need to have with yourself? Somehow you got a less than view of your world. When you got everything in your hands, but yet you convince yourself you're less than, that you're not included, that you don't have, that no blah, 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 victim, 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 victim. It's hard to love somebody when they're playing the victim. Could we just stop it and could you admit that you've got all these blessings and you are included and that people love you and they want you to succeed and they're wanting to include you and embrace you and you keep shoving them away because like Judas, even though you're included, I bet you're convincing yourself you're not. All right, second thing. Judas had character flaws. Now, we all have character flaws. But what do you do with those character flaws? Will you justify them or will you deal with them? Will you pout like a two-year-old that doesn't get their way? Or will you get up, dust off your seat, and go on with life? What did Judas do? I'll give you a story. All right, there's one story. I'm going to give you two verses about this story. And the story is there was a woman who brought this expensive jar of perfume, and she was anointing Jesus with it, and Judas got upset. Well, let's look at the first one. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table of the home, of Simon the Leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar, poured the perfume over his head. Now, some who were present were saying, 
What, what were they saying? They were saying indignantly. Notice the judgmental nature of this. I don't feel that I am included, even though I am. Therefore, what I'm going to do is be negative to everybody else because I'm going to see them through the same negative lens I see myself through. Are y'all awake this morning? I know this is a little hard, but I want to talk to you about how you get to the point where you can betray a friend. You get to the point because you start making up excuses in your own head about how you don't belong. And then what you do is you start being critical of other people. So what happened was we know it was Judas that led the way because John in John chapter 12 verse 3 records the same story and this is what he said. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Give me 30 seconds. One of the reasons I know that John actually wrote the book of John is this line, because you can see him writing it. And who would say the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume except a guy that was there, and as he's writing it, he remembers the smell. You know, smells really strong. You're not going to include that line unless you were there. So here he is. He said, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was, who was the one leading everybody else to be indignant, he, uh, he was the one to later betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and money given to the poor? <laughs> it's worth nearly a year's wages. And we think, yeah, yeah, good argument until we notice this. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So his character flaws led him to be judgmental of other people while he was doing something worse himself. I, I guess this is why everybody's always like, Christians judge too much. Listen, can I give you a little lesson on judging here? The Bible says, do not judge lest you be judged. For with the measure you judge, it will be measured to you. So in other words, if I judge you for being a thief and I steal more than you, <laughs> I'm not only a hypocrite, but I'm also being really stupid because God's going to say, oh, you want to judge them? I'm going to give you not only the judgment I want to give you, but the judgment you gave to them as well. The way to deal with it, according to Jesus, is don't look at the log in somebody else's eye until you have dealt with the speck in your eye. So let's talk about judging for just a second. Yeah, he made a decent argument, but his argument wasn't a decent argument because it came from a wrong motive. The problem with judging is this. As long as you're judging people with the wrong motive, you're not only judging them, you're being judged yourself. Hmm. So Judas was greedy. You know how I know he was greedy and a thief? One action, one time, it might be an accident. But two times, it's proving to be a habit. Right? By the way, somebody told me one time, they were telling me about this relationship they got in, how it ended wrong. And then they said they got in another relationship and it ended the same way. And then they got in a third relationship and it ended the same way. And do you know what I said to them? There's one con common denominator in all three relationships. <laughs> when are we going to deal with us? So here he is. Let's establish this was a habit in his life. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and he asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So what's going on here is Judas was a thief, and he was greedy. And even though he had the riches of Jesus Christ, he was willing to sell out the riches of the kingdom of God for the sake of a few pennies. Think about that. Now, I was thinking about this, and I had to be honest with you, all right? Can I be honest for a second? Um, I don't want to make this sermon about me, but I'll just tell you, I have to identify with what I preach before I can preach it to you. And I was judging myself where my character flaws is. And I, I, can I tell you guys my biggest character flaw? What? 
All right. All right, so when I was a kid, I, I got a bit of a victim mentality, and I started escaping life. Anytime I didn't like anything, I would start by fantasizing. Fantasizing that my true parents would come and take me away from these evil parents. Nobody's ever done that except me, all right? That's, that's just mine. <laughs> fantasizing about winning the Reader's Digest back in the day. They didn't have a lottery. Back then it was Reader's Digest. Now it's the lottery, right? So what happened was I, I taught myself not to deal with reality by fantasizing a different world than the world I lived in. And um, my biggest character flaw is that even today when the pressure or stress gets on or things get going, do you know what I have a tendency to do? I have a tendency to want to fantasize about a life that I couldn't handle if God gave it to me. I remember where I was. I was on Interstate 44. I was driving back from Springfield, Missouri. I was almost to St. Louis, Missouri. I'd been on sabbatical. Me and God had been fighting for the better part of a month. I'd finally relaxed. I was finally listening to him. And I remember where I was on the highway. I could picture clear as a bell where I was. Right now, I can see it. And he spoke to me. He said, why are you so mad about a life you want a life you couldn't handle if I gave it to you. Why don't you live the one I'm giving you the right way? That was God rebuking me, telling me to quit fantasizing. You want to know another time he did it? When I read Psalm 73, 20, you know what it says? God says, I will def despise you as fantasies. God despises fantasies. Dreams he loved. And I want you to dream. Dream big about all you can accomplish, all God wants to do. Dream big. But fantasies? Fantasies will destroy you. There's my character flaw. So I know when I find myself start slipping into bad thinking, I know I got to do something. And you know what I normally do about that time? I pray and I confess I'm wrong, and I usually call a friend, a good friend of mine, and say, hey, man, my thinking's stinking. Would you help me? All right. Are y'all y'all here? Does anybody struggle with any character flaws? Did anybody other than me, you have character flaws? Yeah. If, if, you, if you have a character flaw, welcome to being alive. The question is, are you going to deal with it, or are you going to let it destroy you. And I don't want to get into all the places it destroys me when I let my character flaw go crazy, but you guys get it, right? All right, third of all, Judas betrayed Jesus with a sign of friendship. Jesus knew this was going to happen. It says in the scriptures, the, the couple of places, that Jesus knew who was going to betray him from the very get-go, but he did it. And, and what's funny to me is the night of the Last Supper, Jesus gives Judas, one more chance, a sign of friendship. It's in Matthew chapter 26, 21. While they were eating, he said, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who, noticed this, dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. So there was a bowl, and what they would do is they'd take their bread. Come on, it was, it was like they were at tub. Oh, come on, what's that place, Carabas or something, where they put the oil there, and everybody takes their bread, and you go, like, mm -hmm, and then I'm sick later from all the oil? You know, or, or you go get un, unending salsa and chips, and everybody's sort of sitting around dipping out of the bowl. Oh, by the way, by the way, if you're going to dip from the same bowl as somebody, don't you have to sit close enough to them to dip? Where was Judas then? On this night, where was he at? The end of the table? He was there. As a matter of fact, close enough that Jesus and Judas were sharing a bowl. That is an ultimate act of intimacy and friendship. And here he is, Jesus, giving him a last chance, saying, be my friend. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. <laughs> Jesus answered, You said it. <laughs> I love that answer. You said it. 
You see, what you don't know is if you were to back up in that story, we start at verse 21. If you back up to verse 15, Judas had already received the money for betraying Jesus. And here Jesus is, knowing what's happened, still showing love and friendship. Matthew 26, 27, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him, a large crowd around with swords and clubs. Now we're at the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're praying. And these swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and elders of the people, and the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going to Jesus, he said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Notice Jesus had shared intimacy with the guy who was going to betray him, and at the last moment, Judas feigned intimacy. He faked it with Jesus, knowing all the while he was betraying him with a kiss. Think about the fake intimacy there, the kiss of Judas. How do you think that made Jesus feel? One of the things about that song from 1981 is, I wonder how it makes you feel. Do you ever think about how Jesus feels with some of your reactions? Hmm. All right, last of all, Judas showed remorse, but not repentance. The end of the story is really bad for Judas. (laughs) It does not go well. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with repentance. Is that what it says? Come on, everybody look up, look up. He was seized with what? Is there a difference between remorse and repentance? Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. I want to make a point out of that in just a second, but let's just want you to remember it. And he returned. What did he do? He was seized with remorse, and he returned the money he got for betraying Jesus. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, and he said, I have sinned. Now, isn't that the word you're supposed to say? Can you go to that next slide? I have sinned, for I betrayed innocent blood. Doesn't that sound like what you're supposed to say? But remember, what was his motivation? Remorse. Money, himself, his, I don't fit in, I don't, the victim, it was all the victim. And what it led him to do was to be sorry for what he did, but not repentant for what he did. He said, I've sinned, I've betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? (laughs) They replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money in the temple and left and went out and hanged himself. By the way, part of the story is, this is not in my text, and I I didn't want to talk about it, but I will talk about it. This is something we know about Judas. He went out and hanged himself. And it says that his body, in Acts, it said his body fell headlong and burst open. So that means he hung wherever he hung for long enough for him to bloat up, swell up. Nobody looked for him. Because Judas had cut off all his relationships because it was always all about him. Are y'all getting a picture here of this dude? It's sort of like Benedict Arnold who would leave his good friend to hang while he scampers away to safety so he can get a little money. There's something repeatable here, isn't it? The Judas, the Benedict Arnolds, those who stab you in the back, who are they thinking about in that moment? themselves only. So, can I say one thing about those who, uh, who consider suicide? I, I need to say this. If we're going to bring it up. I want to say don't choose a final solution to a temporary problem. Don't choose a final solution to a temporary problem. If, if you're at a point that suicide is an option for you, and I say this as a guy that's been there, okay? I'm not judging you. I am not. Trust me, I am not. I have been to that level of depression. And I want to say to you, most of what you're going through, if you'll do the right thing in six months, it'll mostly clear up. I read that recently in a psychology book. Not, not a Christian psychology book. Never choose a final solution to a temporary problem. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this remorse repentance thing real quick. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. 
and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. What's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? Worldly sorrow is, I'm sorry that I did this thing that put me in a bad place. <laughs> Judas was sorry that he had sinned because it put him in a bad place. You know what he wasn't sorry about? Offending Jesus. He wasn't sorry that he actually hurt Jesus because repentance and remorse are two different things. Listen, you can be remorseful about all the things you've done wrong in this world, but it doesn't change a thing. At some point, you have to say, I'm sorry that I offended God, that I damaged myself, and I harmed other people. And when you get that attitude about it, there's only one response. It's not to throw things like Judas. It's not to pout. It's not to be remorseful. It's to repent. Can I explain to you what repentance means? Very simple. The best example, and you've heard me, you've been around here, you've heard this because it's the best example. Years ago, I got a phone call from my son. My son was driving to Akron to a, uh, a he was a, a soccer goalie and he was driving to a clinic at the University of Akron. And he called me and he said, Dad, I think I got a problem. And I said, what's that? He had gotten on the turnpike. And when he got on the turnpike, he called me and said, the exit says Sandusky. We, he was right. He had a problem. He was going that way when he needed to go that way. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. My advice to him as a father was just stay on the road and keep driving. You'll eventually get there, right? No? What did I tell him he needed to do? Pay the toll and turn around. Oh, y'all, y'all didn't get that, did you? What are you doing if you've done things wrong in this life? What do you need to do? Pay the toll and turn around. What is repentance? I am going the wrong way. I have an extra toll to pay because I now have to pay for this toll and the toll back. Pay the toll and listen to me. If you've goofed up your life and you made every mistake in the book, listen to me. You are not too far. The fact God put you in this room today, I've got two sayings for you. Pay the toll and come on, let's fix this. Let's get moving in the right way. Quit being the victim. Pay the toll. Admit your sin. Step out of the direction you are heading and go a new direction of life and hope. Right now, today, quit being a Judas and become a Peter. What did Peter do? I have all kinds of jokes. I'm sorry. I cannot say that without jokes going through my head. I apologize for that. I am a junior high boy, and my wife's over there saying, stop it. Jesus, Jesus, by the way, showed his love and devotion to another guy too, a guy named Peter. You ever hear of him? What did Peter do? Peter denied Christ not once, not twice, three times. About an hour later, another, uh, uh, another asserted, certainly this fellow was a Galilean, he replied. Peter replied, I don't know that what you're talking about. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned, looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. And before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So Peter, when he realized he had denied Jesus, when he had, done the very things that Judas had done. Well, yeah, Peter, by, by the way, Peter ran off to a lake to go back to fishing to hide away from Jesus. You can read about it. It's in John chapter 21. He ran away too. He had all the same character flaws, all the same issues, all the same problems. He had them all except for one simple thing. You all ready for the one difference? The one difference is found when Jesus came to restore Peter. John chapter 21, verse 17. Third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. The difference between Judas and Peter is Judas loved himself. 
Peter loved Jesus. He paid the toll. He realized he was wrong. He admitted that he was focused on the wrong things. He quit being remorseful about it, and he became repentant about it. And he said, I am going to quit justifying my fear, my childhood issues. I'm going to quit justifying it all, and I'm going to love Jesus. And you notice three times Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? And he did it on purpose. He wanted Peter to make a confession of love to cover over every time he had denied him. The only difference between Judas and Peter is Judas took a solution out that didn't work. And Peter let Jesus love him too. Jesus loves you. That's why you're here today. Somebody else loves you. That's why you're here today. If a friend invited you, they did it because they love you. Listen, do, do you know what they would probably tell you? If you would listen to them, they would tell you, I'm as big a screw up as you are. That's what I'm telling you. I'm probably a bigger screw up than you. I got one thing different. You ready for one thing? I simply choose to love Jesus more than I love my excuses. And I can tell you when it happened. It didn't happen when I was 17 years old and gave my heart to Christ. It happened in Millersburg, Ohio, about 2001, at 5 o'clock in the morning, the Super 8 Hotel. When I finally decided as a pastor for nearly a dozen, nearly 10 years, as a Christian for nearly 15 years, I decided that morning, 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. wrestling with God, I decided that morning, I would repent and love Jesus. And from that moment, all the excuses in the world don't matter. All the problems in the world don't matter. I still got all the same excuses, all the same problems, all the same character flaws. I got them all. But it's different now. You know why it's different? Because that morning, I paid the toll of laying down my lack of faith. And I returned to love Jesus. What I'm inviting you to do today, I'm inviting you to pay the toll by laying down your excuses. Lay it down. Repent. L drop it. And to turn and say, Jesus, I am going to love you regardless. You say, that sounds too much like blind faith. It is. It is blind faith. It is. And that bugs you for whatever reason. But down deep inside your heart right now, God's just pounding on you. Right inside your heart, He's pounding on you because He loves you so much. He came after you today. He's talking to you. Stop going away from Him. Repent and turn to Him. Today, right now, let this be the day that you tell your grandkids about, your great-grandkids. Let this be the day that you stop being a Judas. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm not talking to you. The Holy Spirit is. You know He is. Right now, you say, today is the day I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to love Jesus. I'm going all in. That's you right now. Today, right now. That's you. Lift your hand. I want to pray with you. Right now. Come on, you know it's you. Yes. Yes. There are others? Come on, you know, yeah. Yes. You know God's talking to you. It's the reason your heart's pounding so much. And I know you're fighting him. Stop fighting him. Accept his love. Come on, his love is freeing. Come on, that's you. Yes. Anybody else? Come on. It's your day. This is the day you're going to... This day changes your world. You don't have to live a victim anymore. You're now a victor in Jesus like we sang. Come on. One more chance. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Let's do something. 
Would everybody stand up with me right now? Please, please, please. Would everybody in this room, because it's friend day and, and we all need friends around us. I want nobody to pray alone, okay? Nobody pray alone. So that means everybody's gonna say the same prayer out loud together. Can we all do this together? Can you show support and love to the person next to you? Let's do this, you ready? Dear Jesus, I have been a Judas. I have denied you. I have betrayed you. I have sinned. Yet you still love me. Thank you for receiving me. I now repent. I pay the toll. I turn back to you. Fill my heart with your love. For I give it completely to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, what just happened is this. You know how Peter went from hiding and running to being the guy that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached and everybody heard him? There was a change in him as a human being. His very character changed. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God gave you the life of Jesus in you. Your very nature and character changed. Right now, today, right here. It happened. Here's what we'd like to do. I'd like to pray with you. We'd like somebody to pray with you. We have prayer teams all across the front up here. It's not just for those of you that gave your heart to Christ, but there are those of you that you just, you're going through something and you're like, I need somebody to pray with me before I go postal on somebody, right? Yeah. yeah Y'all don't, wow, that's so 1999 of me. All right. These guys down here are saying, what's postal mean? Does that mean like you're going to deliver something? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Here's what I'd like you to do. If you want anybody to pray with you today, you gave your heart to Christ, would you come up, talk to somebody and pray with them? They just want to pray with you. Make sure you got a Bible. That's about all we really want to do. And then, um, yeah, somebody to pray with you. And if you have a need and you want somebody to pray with you, you're open this morning. By the way, I let you out on time so your kids are not destroying the place. Please be nice in the parking lot. One other thing, if you've been attending this church for a while and your church family, your family, and you've already gone through membership, would you talk to Pastor Caleb about taking three or four weeks to help us in kids' church over the next couple of weeks? If you're, you don't have to do it for the next 16 years, but if you're already a member, would you talk to him about taking three or four weeks helping kids' church? Would you all do that? Because next week we're going to have so many kids, you don't even know how we're going to deal with them. It's going to be so much fun, and that's why we do this. So, all right, you all ready? The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause His face to smile on you and to give you peace and mercy and blessing. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. God bless you. Somebody's here to pray with you. Have a great week.